Football is a multi-billion dollar business with a multi-billion dollar tax bill. The Premier League alone contributes an annual £8 billion to the UK economy and rising, with the league and its clubs having an overall tax bill of roughly half that amount. Of that £4 billion contributed to the UK exchequer each year, over £1.5 billion is collected from the taxation on players' wages alone. That is not an insignificant figure. In fact, it means that of the £786.6 billion in taxes collected by HMRC in the financial year beginning 2022 and ending in 2023, almost exactly 0.5% came directly from the Premier League. Half a percent might not sound like much, but in the context of the total tax receipts of the country with the sixth largest economy on earth, coming from a single sports league made up of just 20 teams, it is pretty staggering. Amazon, by comparison, paid a total of just £781 million in UK taxes last year, or less than 0.1% of HMRC's total intake, Google paid just £200 million, or 0.025%, and the largest company based in the United Kingdom, Shell, will pay UK tax for the first time in five years this year, due to record profits and a so-called windfall tax, but the oil and gas giant's corporation tax contribution in the UK will still equate to less than the amount that is paid by Premier League players alone. All in all, then, the Premier League is one of Britain's biggest taxpayers. But does that mean that the league and its clubs are paying their fair share? Well, there are recent reports which claim that the answer to that question is no. They claim that, solely in terms of agents fees, Premier League teams have avoided £470 million in tax since 2015 alone, and over £250 million in just the last three seasons. Then there is the issue of the players themselves, many of whom receive a significant amount of their income from image rights deals paid to companies they own, which have much lower tax rates than their playing contracts. There are a whole host of accusations of players and clubs being paid what ought to be salaried income in the form of image rights payments for no good reason other than lowering their tax burden, and HMRC are actively pursuing a number of these cases. It is a murky world then, and an ongoing scandal, in which clubs, agents, and the Premier League themselves deny any wrongdoing, of course they do, and have lots of rebuttals lined up for any accusations fired in their direction. So in today's video, we're going to take a look at those accusations, the rebuttals, and try to answer the question once and for all of whether English football is a giant criminal enterprise or a cash cow that HMRC is just looking to shake down, and if it's the former, whether a major crisis for the league and its clubs could be on the horizon. Financial shenanigans are nothing new in football. Prior to even the dawn of professionalism, sham amateurism or shamateurism was considered a scourge on association football by elites who felt that the sport should be played only for leisure. That is rather a convenient view to hold when your dad owns a bank and you went to Eton, especially when you start losing to a load of working class factory workers from Lancashire. The brown envelopes of the 1800s were followed by illicit overspending in the early 1900s, and the world of football has been mightily creative, shall we just say, in its accounting ever since. It's only a few years ago, after all, that Spanish football was rocked by a massive tax fraud scandal which implicated almost all of the league star players, including Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, and Neymar. Ronaldo, who pled guilty to tax fraud and paid the largest fine of all, was forced to reimburse the Spanish treasury to the tune of nearly 19 million euros. That's enough to cover his current salary in Saudi Arabia for roughly a month. Presumably the lack of any income tax in Saudi Arabia played a key role in Ronaldo's decision to move there. After all, you can't be fined for paying something that doesn't exist. The Premier League has, as of yet, managed to avoid any major scandals of a similar scale, but that could all be about to change. 
A few months ago, Tax Policy Associates, which is a non-profit founded by the British tax lawyer Dan Needle, which advises policymakers and journalists on issues relating to taxation, published a new report in which they claim that Premier League clubs had avoided almost half a billion pounds worth of tax over the last eight years by artificially structuring their payments to agents. Needle and TPA stated that by falsely alleging that agents were representing both the player and the club, in almost all Premier League transfer and new contract agreements, basically any monetizable transaction between a player and a football club, Premier League teams and players had effectively halved their tax liability. Here's how it works. Most footballers have agents who act on their behalf. These agents tend to take a commission every time a player moves clubs or signs a new contract, as well as permanently being in receipt of a percentage of a player's earnings. Historically, that is between 3 to 10%, though FIFA and FA rules have recently introduced contentious new rules to cap the percentage of a player's salary that an agent can be paid, but we'll come to that later on. As far as you or I may be concerned, the agent is working on the player's behalf. They are seeking to get the best possible terms for their clients and secure them a move to the biggest, richest, or just otherwise most appealing club interested in signing their client. They have a professional requirement to do that, it is literally their job, but also a personal incentive, given that if they receive a cut of every deal and every contract, the higher the fees and the salary involved, the more money that they will earn. Officially, however, in the vast majority of Premier League transfers and contract extensions, the agent is recorded as having worked on behalf of both the player and the club. Not only that, they are cited in almost all deals as having done an equal amount of work for both parties, and they therefore receive 50% of their fee from the player they represent, and 50% of their fee from the club themselves. If you're thinking that sounds a little suspicious, you are not alone. Given the fact that an agent is seeking as much money as possible for their client, and therefore themselves, and a club is looking to pay as little money as possible while still retaining their players or securing their transfer targets, it would appear to present a pretty blatant conflict of interest for anyone to be acting on behalf of both parties in that transaction. According to Needle and the TPA, the reality is that there is no conflict of interest because the agents don't represent the clubs at all. The whole thing is a sham. They claim that the reason for this 50-50 payment split, which is known as dual representation and is actually semi-outlawed by football's authorities, despite the fact that it is so prevalent, is because it halves the amount of tax that is owed on the overall transaction, therefore benefiting all three parties involved. Basically, if an agent's fee were paid solely by the player, as they argue it should, and indeed, as was at one time the norm, it would come out of the player's after-tax earnings, sign-on fees, and bonuses. Much like if you or I want to pay someone to provide a service for us, let's just say a window cleaner, we would most likely have to pay for that service with our after-tax earnings. As far as HMRC is concerned then, in terms of the fee that is paid to the agent, if that were the case, they would get to tax it twice, once on the player's end and once on the agent's. By claiming dual representation though, and that they are acting on behalf of both the player and the club, in most instances, agents receive half of their fee from the club, which is only taxed once, and has the even greater tax advantage from the club's perspective, given that they are able to claim VAT back. To give a working example, let's say Luton Town this summer have allocated £1 million in agents' fees that they are willing to spend in order to sign Boulay Dia from Salernitana. Admittedly, it is an ambitious target for the Hatters, but that's not really the point. If Dia's agent was only paid by him in exchange for representing him and not by Luton, 
after national insurance and income tax, Deal would receive £534,000 of that initial £1 million with which to pay his agent, but then when he paid his agent, the agent themselves would incur a further £78,000 VAT bill, meaning that of that initial £1 million allocated by Luton Town for the agent, HMRC would receive £612,000 and the agent just £388,000. There will be those of you thinking that seems a little bit harsh. I may even have done the unthinkable there and made you feel sorry for a football agent for the first time in your lives, but you probably ought not. I don't just mean you ought not because... Even in that example, they have just received a one-off payment of nearly £400,000 for facilitating a single transfer, but rather because even if everything was above board, and this is how players, clubs and agents operated, it would most likely just result in agents negotiating higher fees. Footballers are in high demand, agents often play a key role in where they end up, and clubs are therefore willing to outcompete one another particularly at the top end of the game, e.g. the Premier League. That's why the biggest driver in this whole tax avoidance scheme are the clubs themselves, whose accountants are actually reported to have been in dialogue, or to have collaborated, if you want to use that word, with other Premier League clubs, in order to create a system where everyone is at it, in the hope that such ubiquity would give the scheme an air of legitimacy, or failing that, at least a sense in which it is too big to fail, since any attempt to punish it would require hefty fines and punishments being imposed upon every club in the division. Back to that working example though, now imagine that Luton Town have allocated that same £1 million for Boulay Dia's agent's fees, but this time the agent is put down as being a dual representative, working on behalf of both the player and the club. Now £500,000 is paid to the player for him to pass on to his agent, so it is taxed in the same way as the first example, and ends up being worth £194,000 in the agent's pocket. But the other £500,000 is paid directly to the agent by Luton Town, who can claim the VAT back, so the agent receives the entire £500,000. In total, therefore, the agent has gone from receiving just £388,000 if they were paid by the player themselves out of their after-tax earnings, to £694,000 when half of their fee is paid for by the club. That is a loss, if you like, to HMRC of £306,000 on a single transaction, and it is the difference between an effective 62% tax rate and a 30.6% tax rate. You can see then, when almost every club operates on this basis, how the amount of tax that has been avoided, when agents often receive enormous fees, can rapidly start to add up and TPA claimed their estimates of £250 million over the last three seasons and £470 million since 2015 are highly conservative, and that they suspect the actual figures could be considerably higher. In 2021, FA data revealed that 68% of all Premier League deals involve dual representation. Agents, clubs, and the Premier League themselves you won't be all that surprised to discover, claim that this is all above board and deny even the implication of any wrongdoing. A Premier League spokesperson commented in response to the report, quote, We believe that the overall figure suggested here is based on assumptions that do not recognise the individual circumstances of each transaction. End quote. The Association of Football Agents, or the AFA, went a little bit further than that, stating that the report demonstrated, quote, a fundamental misunderstanding of how the football transfer market works, adding, dual representation recognises the substantive services delivered by the agent to each party, end quote. This is a claim that is made by both teams and agents alike. The dual representation is legitimate because the agent is actually providing a valuable service to both the player and the club. They would point to things like assisting with work permits, helping the player settle in at their new club and into their new surroundings, 
and most notably of all, from the club's perspective, aiding them in their attempt to sign a player ahead of any rivals for his or her signature. Of course, those things do all benefit the clubs, but they primarily benefit the player who I think any fair-minded person would conclude an agent is primarily acting on behalf of, except perhaps in the case of George Mendes at Wolves, who is practically on the club's permanent payroll. Even if you were of the view that, despite all of those things being part and parcel of the role provided to a player by an agent regardless, because it was causally benefiting the clubs, the clubs should therefore pay an agent a fee, it would seem still much harder to justify that fee being 50%, and that's where clubs could find themselves in deep water if HMRC chooses to pursue them. There is a very big legal distinction between tax avoidance and tax evasion. Tax avoidance typically refers to any legal mechanism for reducing a company or an individual's tax liability, and could be something as simple as paying into an ISA or a pension. Tax evasion, on the other hand, occurs when you deliberately and dishonestly avoid paying the tax that you are legally obliged to pay. FIFA and the FA actually prohibited dual representation a while back, but with one rather significant exemption. The FA rules on dual representation state, quote, A football agent may only perform football agent services and other services for one party in a transaction, subject to the sole exception in this article. A. Permitted dual representation. A football agent may perform football agent services and other services for an individual and an engaging entity in the same transaction, provided that prior explicit written consent is given by both clients. End quote. This sole exception is in fact the norm, but nonetheless doesn't break any rules. The 50-50 split on the other hand, well, that just might. Dual representation may be allowed by the FA's exemption clause, but the cut of an agent's fee, that is to say, how much of it is paid by the club and how much by the player, should reflect the amount of work that they have done and the service that they have provided on either party's behalf. By paying a 50-50 split in almost all circumstances, that is very plainly not what is happening. And even in the most extreme cases, it would seem hard to imagine an instance in which a club would legitimately be paying more than a quarter of an agent's overall fee. If, therefore, as quite clearly seems to be the case, clubs are artificially structuring their payments to agents in a deliberately misleading manner, which is a very fancy way of saying that they are lying to HMRC, with the sole purpose of lowering the tax burden for themselves and for the agents, then that is of course illegal. If HMRC were to pursue Premier League teams on account of the misleading structuring of agents' fees, therefore, Needle concludes, and I would be inclined to agree with him just based upon the available evidence, albeit with much less expertise regarding tax law, they would most likely win. There is precedent for HMRC scrutinising the financial affairs of Premier League clubs and recovering enormous amounts of unpaid tax. Between 2015 and 2022, across all areas of the football industry, HMRC recovered £573 million, more than half a billion pounds, or three quarters of Amazon's total annual UK tax bill that would otherwise have gone unpaid. If HMRC also came after clubs for the improper payment of agents, some clubs would be impacted much more heavily than others. Needle and the TPA, looking solely at the 2020-21 season, in which they estimate a total of £81 million of tax was avoided because of the scheme, found Manchester City and Manchester United to be the biggest offenders, each owing in excess of £10 million for that season alone, followed by Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea, and, somewhat unsurprisingly, Wolves. Basically, the highest spending clubs, plus the one that is in the pocket of the world's most powerful agent. One criticism of the Tax Policy Associates report that I might be inclined to agree with is that it does seem to illustrate some misunderstandings of football finance. The report states, for example, that because Premier League profits for the previous season were only £479 million, 
HMRC recovering £470 million from clubs could have, quote, potentially serious consequences for football. There could be some nasty FFP and profit and sustainability implications for clubs, if that repayment was considered part of their annual accounts, but given that the richest clubs, owned exclusively now by multi-billionaires and states, would have the biggest tax bills to repay, the consequences would largely be in terms of their ability to keep spending at the same levels for a couple of seasons, rather than anything more severe. In short, profit is not a very good metric by which to measure the financial capabilities or overall wealth of football clubs, least of all Premier League clubs. The payments of agents isn't the only aspect of football finance where HMRC might be missing out. In July 2022, it was revealed that a record 329 footballers in England, including some of the Premier League's biggest stars, were under investigation for tax avoidance, triple the number that were investigated the previous season. A further 31 clubs and 91 agents were also revealed as being under investigation. Most of these cases, which primarily concern Premier League players and some of the highest earners in the Championship, relate to image rights payments. Footballers pay an enormous amount of tax when compared to comparatively wealthy people as a whole because they are employees. Most people who earn more than £20 million a year, as someone like Erling Haaland reportedly does at Manchester City, and even those with 50 to 100 times Haaland's overall wealth, make money through their existing and ever-expanding capital. So, stocks, property, or private companies, for example. It is called capitalism for a reason. Earnings through those means, which is how most of the rich and super-rich accrue and maintain their wealth, is taxed at a much lower rate than earned income, which is how the vast majority of much less wealthy, ordinary working people make a living. I know, it seems like kind of a scam, but we haven't the time to get into all of that right now. While Sterling Haaland pays close to 50% tax on his Manchester City salary, as opposed to under 40% for dividends and 20% for capital gains, when it comes to his image rights, that is to say, his legal rights over his own image, name, likeness, voice, signature, and other personal characteristics, he is able to form a company which, instead of paying individual tax rates, is able to pay business rates. In effect, whilst Haaland pays close to 50% tax on his Manchester City salary, he pays just 19% on his commercial income via his image rights holding company. That is assuming that Haaland's image rights company is domiciled in the United Kingdom. Many Premier League players, particularly foreign ones, form offshore image rights companies, further reducing their tax bill. As with dual representation, there is nothing illegal about doing this, but what HMRC are concerned with is clubs overinflating the value of a player's image rights to them whilst artificially reducing their salaried income so as to, once again, reduce the overall tax burden. In the case of someone like Haaland or Mohamed Salah, clearly their image rights are actually very valuable to Manchester City and Liverpool, but when Championship or obscure bottom half Premier League players are earning a substantial portion of their overall income from their clubs through image rights, that inevitably leads to some suspicion. Even in the case of extremely marketable players, it is of course still possible to inflate the value of what would be legitimately lucrative image rights deals. In 2019, HMRC successfully reclaimed over £400,000 from my club Hull City, not literally my club, just the team I support, I didn't have to pay any of it, owing to the Tigers having paid Giovanni £440,800 into an offshore account between December 2008 and July 2010, which HMRC deemed to be tax avoidance by illegitimate means. Several other clubs have had similar cases found against them, but as with Giovanni's case taking roughly a decade, most of the biggest cases are yet to reach a conclusion and yet to reach the public domain. It's important to note that neither dual representation amongst agents nor seemingly inflated image rights fees paid by clubs are issues that are exclusive to the Premier League. 
These are practices that are common and, in many cases, are actively being investigated throughout almost all of Europe's top leagues, where the finances involved are high and, inevitably therefore, particularly prominent in the Premier League, which has exerted such financial dominance over every other league in recent years. There are, of course, some much more elaborate stories of teams allegedly cooking the books, so to speak. A report in Der Spiegel, containing information released by football leaks in 2018, alleged, and appeared to provide evidence, that Roberto Mancini had received more money directly from Abu Dhabi than he was paid by Manchester City themselves during his time managing the club. Of course, if true, the primary goal there was to reduce Manchester City's outgoings for profit and sustainability purposes within their own accounts. But there could also have been serious tax implications of interest to HMRC if that claim can be substantiated. Similar accusations have been levelled against Manchester City in relation to payments made to Yaya Torre, which have been denied by the Ivorian's agent, and even stranger yet is the club's relationship with a company owned by Vincent Company. Company supposedly owns, or did own, a third of a company called Elite Limousines VIP Protection Services Limited, which had a very lucrative contract with Manchester City to ferry around his millionaire teammates. Gary Cook, who is the man believed to have awarded Company's company with the contract, which presumably, you know, had nothing to do with Company playing for the club, resigned as Manchester City's chief executive in 2011 over claims that he had emailed Neda Manua's cancer-suffering mother mocking her illness. In January 2023, he was appointed as the executive president and CEO of the Saudi Professional League. Football really is a cesspit at times, isn't it? Soon after the story about companies, limousine company broke in the news, one of his co-owners appeared in court defending multiple charges of employing an unlicensed driver, using a motor vehicle without third-party insurance, using a private hire vehicle that was not displaying the correct plate or disc information, and withholding information to obtain motor insurance. Before 2011 was finished, Company had seemingly resigned from his role and relinquished his interest in the company. That is a bit of a side issue to the more wholesale schemes of tax avoidance in football, but I thought that you might find it interesting nonetheless. Ultimately, despite the protestations of players, agents, clubs, and the league themselves, there are several cases against all four parties the HMRC would stand a very high probability of winning. None of this is new, though. In fact, for a while, it was the case that clubs would pay the entirety of an agent's fee, rather than just 50%, before seemingly coming to the collective realisation that they were pushing their luck a little bit too far, and a 50-50 split would be less likely to raise suspicion, investigations, and ultimately prosecution. There is, if you like, an ongoing game of cat and mouse between football and the UK Treasury, where loopholes are exploited and then only semi-shut down, in which HMRC has won back several hundred pounds in recent years, but seems reluctant to push too hard. It's likely there are several fights that HMRC could pick with the Premier League and its clubs, perfectly legitimately it should be said, and win. But whether they want to do so, as forcibly as they conceivably could, and whether that would be politically expedient, shall we just say, is an entirely different question. The reality is that, when it comes to tax avoidance, whilst the Premier League are by no means any saints, footballers themselves are enormous taxpayers. And the worst offenders, as the figures that I quoted from Amazon, Google, and Shell in the introduction illustrate, most assuredly are not from the world of football. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as of watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure, of course, that you are subscribed to both this channel and my second channel, Alfie Potts Armour, both of which should be on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.